Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Kukurl, and I'm the MC for the Affiliate Summit West here at the Rio Casino. And welcome. Um, let's pull this up here. And thanks, everybody, for coming. It's great. <clears throat> so I want to do a few quick reminders uh, based upon what you just saw there. Just real quickly, the, the passport to prizes is uh, there's a, a thing in your bag, and if you go to every booth and you get stamps, they have prizes they'll give away, and you turn in your, um, your map uh, to the registration desk, and that'll be held on Tuesday where they'll give away prizes. Um, the Wi-Fi is available only in near the dining area. Um, Affiliate Summit uh, is the Wi-Fi name. There's no password needed. You'll see nodes one through eight. Um, lunch, very important. If you're an exhibitor, lunch is at noon. If you are everyone else here, lunch is at 12.30. And um, of course, today's keynote is streamed live on Webmaster Radio, the official radio and podcast network for the Affiliate Summit. And the Webmaster Radio party tonight featuring a special appearance by the Blue Man Group, um, hosted by uh, Pepper Jam, Rocket Profit, and Forge. So be sure to go to that tonight. So as I said, my name is Jim Kukrell. I'm the uh, MC for this event. <coughs> And I think I've missed maybe one of these events in the last five years. Uh, it's just a, it's a great show to come to. Um, I think if you're, whether you're a first time person coming to the show or you're a veteran who's come to the show uh, for a long time, I think you're gonna find out what I already know, that it is a great event. And the reason I think it's a great event is a couple reasons. Number one, this is really a fun crowd. A lot of people come here, have a great time, share things. Uh, a lot of smart people too. Number two, the, inf the, the speakers here are really amazing. I don't think you're going to see any sales pitches. If you do, you'll probably hear from Sean and Missy, but uh, <laughs> I think you're going to get a lot of great information. And number three, I think the biggest reason that I like the Affiliate Summit is, and I love the affiliate marketing industry, is because we're really best of breed marketers. And I, I don't think a lot of people outside um, <clears throat> the affiliate marketing industry really understand that, that we do everything. You know, we're not just search. You know, we're not just affiliate. We do search, we do email, we do pay-per-click, we do uh, landing page optimization. I mean, affiliate marketers really go across the gamut of everything that online marketing entails. So if you're new here, you're going to learn that. And if you've gone to other shows, like search shows, you're going to also see that there's a big difference here. Very educated people here. So in a minute, I'm going to bring up Jason uh, Calcanis. But uh, first, I want to just say something about um, conference organizers. Sean Collins, Missy Ward do a great job putting this together. It's such a big show now. It's a lot of fun. And I just want to say thank you to them and their staff who do a really good job. Let's give them a quick round of applause. So Sean, Missy, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. Um, so let's talk today <clears throat> about Jason Calacanis. He's the keynote. Uh, met him first time this morning, and um, I, I introduced uh, Mark Cuban at a, an event last fall, and he said the same thing to me. I said, I'm introducing you today, and he said, just keep it short. You know, so these, I think these guys like to get up here on stage and do their thing. So I'm going to keep it short, I promise. So, so who is Jason Calacanis? He's somewhat of a lightning rod in the online tech geek marketing community. Obviously, I've been following him for years. Successful entrepreneur, um, business owner, uh, loudmouth. You know, I could say that, because um, I am too. But <clears throat> So Jason holds court in the online geek world. And let's talk a little bit about how he got his start. I mean, he started as a, a reporter and a publisher in the late 90s and had a magazine, right? So what did he do after that? He went out and co-founded a thing called Weblogs Inc. And Weblogs Inc. was a network of 50 blogs that was run on an advertising model. And uh, built that up. You may know some of the blogs in there, like Gizmodo and Gadget, right? Yeah. So there's two, probably two of the more bigger blogs that came out of the network. Yeah. So, you know, Jason did that, built it up, nice little business. And uh, opportunity knocked, and this time it was uh, AOL. And AOL said, hey, we love what you built up here, and uh, you know, let's buy it from you. And, and according to Wikipedia, it says 25 million. Is that a rumor? It's up? 
Okay. So congrats on that. So six months later, uh, I, I told you I was going to be brief. Six months later, he went and he got a call from Netscape. I'm not sure if he got a call or you called them, but they said, look, let's bring back the Netscape brand. Let's take on Dig and Delicious and, and try to build a whole community-based uh, thing like that. So he went and did that. But after he did that, yet again, he was said, you know, as most entrepreneurs do, he said, look, I got to find the next big thing. I got to figure out what I can do next that's going to top this. You know, I've sold the AOL. I've built this big blog network. I'm a, I talk in the community. I'm, I'm getting well known. And he said, well, I think what I'll do next is I'll take on Google. So Jason went out and created this search engine called Mahalo, which he is now currently promoting. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that. But, um, you know, taking on Google, I mean, that's a pretty lofty goal there. And Mahalo is billed as the world's first human-powered search engine. So along the way in that journey, you know, Jason really, I talked a little bit about this. He came out and he's been very vocal in the industry. He's got a lot of people, things that he say, he says, cause a lot of problems, you know, which is good. It's good for everybody, I think. So, you know, he took on Danny Sullivan at a search show one time and said SEO is bullshit. And, uh, you know, I think to the search guru people, they were a little upset by that. And then um, what, he compared uh, SEO people to snake oil salesmen. Is that what it was? Yeah. So, <laughs> so he does a good job at uh, getting the, the sound bites out there. So we're hoping for some of those today, by the way. So, uh, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm almost done here. So, you know, last night I'm checking my Twitter. And this is what I see from Jason. It says, on the way to Vegas for Affiliate Summit, the keynote should be um, interesting. So and when I talked to him this morning, I've pretty much confirmed that. He's, he thinks he's, he's got some really good stuff to drop on all of us here today. So uh, you know, we're counting on it. I'm looking for some good stuff. And uh, what's he going to say about us? Let's find out. And hopefully we're all talking about it. I'm really excited about having him up here because he's not really an affiliate guy. Right. So you're an outside perspective, but you're a thought leader in, in sort of a different niche. I mean, online marketing in general. But So I'm really excited about hearing what he's got to say. So let's just bring him up. Jason, Kyle Canis. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, affiliate marketing is bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> That's what you all expect me to do. I'm not going to do that. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you today about, and I'm going to be honest, uh, everybody, how many people want me to be honest? How many people want me to just sort of give you the sugar loving? How many people want honest? Okay, good. So this is going to be like a therapy session for all of us. Some tears maybe, it's okay, we'll get it out of our system. Um, the internet, in my mind, was founded on three basic prin principles. How many people were on the internet before 1996? Okay, good. So you guys know this. Free communication, free information, and of course, a level playing field. And that's what we all bought into, right? It was open, anybody could do anything, and it wasn't who you know, it was what you knew, and it wasn't even what you knew, it was what you executed on. And there were really some great platforms on the internet, like Usenet, right? And this started in 1979. How many people were on Usenet before 1995? Wow, this is an incredibly seasoned audience. Um, and everybody knows Usenet was supposed to change the world because scientists could talk to each other and for the first time every cancer researcher would know uh, what every other cancer researcher was gonna do. And you know, poetry fans could meet each other on a global basis and it would just evolve society in such an incredible way and then this happened. And some of you may have gotten this email. It was about a green card. How many people remember the green card email? Okay, so I'll fill you in on what this is. One day, somebody decided if I, I'm trying to get people green cards, a lawyer, if I posted to every single Usenet news group, I might be able to sell my services um, to more people. And it would be incredibly efficient and cheap to do so. So they made a little script and they put this email on every single Usenet news group. And Usenet, which was an incredibly vibrant community, I mean, Usenet was the blogs of another era. It was the message boards of another era. It was the forums. And it was the first selfish act done on the internet. It was the first spam. And if you go to any news group today, 
And let's say you did a search for um, going to uh, travel in Europe, rec travel Europe. What you find is every single link is spam. How many people have used Usenet in the last week to get information or discuss a topic? Exactly. You did. Oh, you, this is one of your spam emails? <laughs> Busted. OK. How many people you know, has, have had an intelligent discussion on Usenet like 10 years ago or learned something on Usenet 10 years ago? Exactly. This was a very vibrant community, and it was killed by overzealous marketers. It's gone forever. It was destroyed. We polluted the pond. We destroyed Usenet. And if you go to Google today, and we do a search here for the cotton gin and its effects on slavery that, like a student might do, you'll see all these great search results. And um, you might really be satisfied with this result, except, as we all know, um, a large percentage of these are malware links. Not even bad links, but malware. Everybody remembers the malware attack from about, what was it, early December this year? Uh, Google just came out with a study last week. 1.3% of the links in Google searches are malware. We're polluting the pond again. So the question is, are we going to pollute it so badly that it is destroyed and nobody gets any benefit from it? And if you were to click on one of those links, you guys know what you guys have seen all this before. You know, they're storing these things in GIFs. And uh, of course, your machine does one of these numbers, unless you're on a Mac, and then you don't see that. Um, and this was all done through comment. Uh, the way they got the great ranking was, of course, people leaving their comments open and not putting no follow on it. Again, the pollution continues in comments. How many people have deleted comment spam from their blog in the last two weeks? Thank you. OK. How many people spend over an hour a month deleting comment spam on their blogs? OK. So that's like 100 people. That's 100 hours of wasted time. How many people spend over five hours a month deleting comments spam? Exactly. You're embarrassed to say. Me too. Um, so this, of course, leads to the question, well, how can thousands of engineers at Google get duped by a couple of spammers? Right? It doesn't make any sense. Well, smart people can get duped. As a matter of fact, smart people can do the duping. Uh, Seth Godin is a very smart guy and a friend of mine. I don't know if we're still friends, because I've been writing him pretty hard about the Squidoo spam issue. Um, but you know, he created the site Squidoo. How many people here have been on the site Squidoo? Exactly. How many people here use Squidoo as a business tool or to make money in some way? Great. Exactly. Uh, Squidoo um, is supposed to be this great place where people can share knowledge, right? It sounds a lot like Usenet and they can help each other, except when you go on there and you start looking at these sites and you put them into Google and you do a search for them, what you find is that a large percentage of the content is actually stolen. And I'm just going through a couple of examples here of just all the scraped content on Squidoo. And if you go here to one of the top 40 sites, and you go through these download movie rentals, I don't know if this belongs to somebody in the uh, audience. If it does, you can raise your hand. And, but it's filled with affiliate spam. Every freaking link is an affiliate link. Now, I say affiliate spam. Why do I call it affiliate spam? I see some people cringing that I put spam next to the word affiliate. Well, it's because this is stolen content, and it's presented only for the purpose of making the person who made the site money. There is no value here to users. There's no reason to steal other people's content. You can go to the original content. There's no reason for you to be a disintermediary, uh, disintermediary between Amazon. People know to go to Amazon. Why does this site even exist? Why does Squidoo even exist? It exists to pollute the internet. So why would a smart person like Seth Godin be polluting the river that we all have to drink from and our kids have to go into? Well, sm smart people get caught up in this, and it's the page view trap. It's the crack of page views. It's the crack of making money. And as an industry, there is a real disjoint in our industry between people's attitudes. People believe on the internet that if you can, you're technically capable of doing something, then it's OK. That is internet morality. And that's why Usenet doesn't exist. That's why spam is such a big issue. And that's why search engines are being polluted so badly. Dave Sifri, a good friend of mine, Ev Williams, another good friend of mine, created Technorati and Blogger. They did it individually, not together. And uh, if you go to Technorati, how many people use Technorati on a regular basis? OK, everybody knows what Technorati is. It's awesome to be with smart people. And if you do a search here, um, and I went through a bunch of these uh, searches, it turns out like everything is spam. And how many people do like an ego search for themselves on Technorati? Like, you know when you do your ego search how much spam there is out there, right? I mean, because you see all these things, and you're like, wow, they took Jason Calacanis 
you know, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th, Jason and the Argonauts, and somebody made this weird blogger site that has, you know, all the Jason content mixed up, and it's like half about me and half about Jason and the Argonauts and half about Friday the 13th. I mean, what the fuck? It's like, what is this? And then I read and I've wasted my time, and they, you know, anybody in this site create, anybody here create those sites? Because I'll kill you if I find you. <laughs> and if you look at the results of this, just one search, you know, majority is spam and, you know, and then you have people who aren't so smart, um, but kind of nice, and, but in a delusional kind of way, like Ted Murphy from Paper Post. Anybody here from Paper Post? Or I can kill yourself. Um, just kidding, it's a joke. Um, well, I wouldn't mind it if you did. Um, and, you know, they, they're, oh, we're going to enable people to make money, and, you know, and they, disclose, they can disclose if they put a little icon on the bottom right that nobody will ever see. And here's a great site about cord blood that, you know, if you were pregnant, you might want to know about cord blood, and it looks pretty good. And here's another nice blog with a beautiful home sweet home, and there's more about cord blood. And here's some more sites about cord blood, a nice blogger. This is a really important issue. And, uh, we just can go on and on because you guys know about this. And then here's the paper post blog where somebody says, you know what? I'm a paper post blogger. I'm embarrassed to be doing this. Like, what are we doing here? Those were all paid posts. People looking, for, and they were ranking too. That's why Google has said to paper post, you're done. They're expelling them. You guys can only be selfish. I don't want to say you guys. I'm talking to paper post guys. You can, and the affiliate people who are doing spam. And I know there are two groups of people, and I know there's a lot of gray between these two things, and I'm painting with a wide brush. But in general, we, as a group, can abuse these systems only so much before they collapse. And the person who does the abusing might make the quick buck. So paper posts might look really smart, and everybody would be really jealous of them. Oh, they're making a ton of money, and the paper post bloggers are getting $15 a blog post instead of getting no traffic and making a little bit on AdSense. But you know what? They're pissing in the well. And we let it happen in our industry. That's the problem, is that we are tolerant of this kind of poisoning of the well. Here's Matt Cutts, a really smart guy. And as you know, Google is smacking down these links. And he thinks they're doing a pretty good job at it. Of course, if I do this healthcare search here, and this is California Health Insurance. You guys uh, probably created some of these sites, or people might be the affiliate companies that enable these. And the affiliate companies have some um, culpability here. The affiliate companies are creating the infrastructure that allows people to make the profit on poisoning the well and polluting the river. And the affiliate companies have blinders on. They don't police stuff. How many people are here from an affiliate company? Raise your mind. Somebody here has to work for an affiliate company. <laughs> We're at the affiliate summit. How many affiliate? I saw like 20 people brave enough to raise their hands. I'm not going to point anybody out. Yeah, commission Junction. Um, <laughs> How many of you spend any time policing? Yeah, like one guy raised. Of course, like, it's like we don't have the time or the resources to police, right? But this is just like the environmental issue. You don't have the time to do it until global warming happens and the ice cliffs start falling off and the temperatures raise and New Orleans has a flood. Like, how long do we ignore what we're doing to our own environment? This is our world. We're poisoning it with this crap. And we're sending the users away. The users aren't going to stick around for this nonsense. And you know, with that other search, it was like all affiliate spam and spam. And you know what? Curation is coming. And it's coming because it's good business. Just like green is good business. People are selling green and organic shit for like 50% more margin. It's a good business thing. And it's, it's, it's good for business today because of all the damage idiots like Paper Post are doing. Those schmucks are making it harder for the people who are doing legitimate stuff, but they're also tightening the noose around their own necks. The more they do deceptive marketing, the more they piss off their own user base. And the more those advertisers are going to get called out on it, and the more good businesses are going to profit. So what I want to talk to you today is about how you could maybe pay a post could turn to the good side. There might still be good in you, Ted Murphy. I can sense it. I can sense the conflict. Oh no. Do we lose power? What's oh, no science? Okay, screw it. Um, so, um, city search. Uh, I can't see it though. So, we have city search here. Um, we got Yelp, right? A little more curation. And Yelp 
has we got Angie's List, which is ultimate curation. You can only post on this site. Anybody here an Angie's List member? How awesome is Angie's List? Pretty freaking awesome. You can only, are you from Angie's List? You from the company Angie's List? I love you, man. I love you. I love your service. I'm watching you. Um, Angie's List, my wife loves this site. I mean, like every person who works at our house, like plumber, whatever, something breaks, she's on Angie's List. It's genius. You have to be a real person. There's no anonymity. You have to sign up with a credit card. Why? Because these other services are getting filled with spam and social marketers. You know, then you have the, you know, uh, whole uh, social networking craze, right? And people were putting fake profiles on MySpace. And then Facebook came along and said, no, no more fake profiles. You have to be real, right? Again, more ownership of what you're doing in the system, more curation. Facebook actually goes and deletes the fake people. Facebook is a more trusted environment. People don't go on MySpace because it's polluted. They're moving to Facebook because it's less polluted. The more you police it, the better you'll do as a company in the long term. The problem is a lot of people are short-term thinkers. And of course, the ultimate is Facebook is now, uh, you know, you have LinkedIn, where it's even more real. It's, you can't have a fake profile on LinkedIn, very hard to do. Wikipedia, easy to game, lots of anonymity. People are trying to make that more curated with Citizendium and Veripedia. Who knows if they're gonna win? Probably not, but at least they're making an effort and they'll, they're making an effort to have experts and to verify information. It's probably gonna lead to better behavior on Wikipedia. YouTube, lots of stolen content from heroes, giving way to Hulu, curated content where you know you're getting it. Technorati, lots of spam, giving way to tech meme, which is whitelisted and curated. Curation is happening all around us on a pretty regular basis. Even I use, blo I use blog lines for my blog search. How many people use blog lines blog search? It's really the best one out there. It's like the best kept secret because it's only based upon how many people subscribe to it. And now I probably effed it because somebody's gonna go subscribe like a thousand times with their thousand different slave robots and screw it up. But if you put more effort in, you'll get the longer term reward. So this is really the only self-serving slide I have here. We started a site called Engadget, Autoblog, Joystick, a bunch of them. And its trajectory was very slow. We put years of effort into it and it eventually made a lot of money. But if you look at the effort versus money sort of chart here for something like Squidoo, it makes a lot of money, it makes a little bit of money in a really quick time. That's what you get out of doing a Squidoo page. And then eventually, Google kicks you out, Yahoo kicks you out, they realize you're producing crap, they realize you're polluting, they catch you, you get a fine, you get bumped out, and you gotta go start this crack hit all over again. You're better off just taking that slow, steady curve. It's harder, it's more investment, but it's better. And when we look at this, if you break this into quadrants, and you look at that bottom right-hand quadrant, that's the low work, high reward quadrant. That's where people like pay propose, that's where people like Squidoo, that's where spammers live. That's the wrong part of the American dream. That's the part of the American dream that I wanna get rich quick. I wanna win the lottery. I wanna steal, I wanna get mine, you know? So, I don't know why I'm going into a redneck voice. <laughs> I gotta get mine, you know? I'm gonna get paid, whatever. Um, and then to the left of that, you have the low work, low reward. I didn't work so hard, I didn't get such a big reward. The truth is, a lot of this affiliate marketing stuff and a lot of this SEO stuff is a Ponzi scheme where the people who have gotten lucky enough to do low work and get a high reward trick the dumbasses into buying their systems and get into, get into this whole affiliate you know, whirlpool to do low work for low reward. Again, painting with a wide brush, I know there's people doing good work on good sites. Those are the Engadget people who are trying to build the good high quality sites over a long period of time. And then you have this sort of sucky quadrant where you worked really hard and you got a low reward. But at least you feel good about yourself. You made the movie, people loved it, nobody went to see it. But at least you can be proud of yourself that you made a good film and you worked hard doing so. And then there's the pinnacle, which is high work, high reward. As human beings, we all wanna work hard, we all wanna get a big reward. That's the American dream. That's what's right about America. That's what's right about entrepreneurship, is when you work hard and get the reward. That's the quadrant you wanna live in, and if you live in that quadrant, you feel satisfaction, pride, and honor, and if you live in this bottom one here, a normal person feels ashamed. That's what a normal person feels. Well, I didn't work so hard, and I didn't get a reward. I should've worked harder, right? I'm kind of ashamed of myself, I should've worked harder. You know, like I could've done better on the test. What does a criminal person think? Well, they think, oh, it's a thrill, it's satisfying. That's the criminal mindset. And that's, I think, what the internet has turned into. In the beginning days of the internet, 
We were about creating quality content and services for people. And then this sort of criminal mindset came in. It's a Lex Luthor, you know, uh, mindset where like if I can, ca you know, it's like, uh, remember that great scene in um, Austin Powers where they're like, we have something better than holding the world ransom for a million dollars or $10 million. We, we created Starbucks and we're, we're making $4.50 per cup of coffee. I just paid $3 for a cup, small cup of drip. I mean, there's nothing more criminal than that. You don't need to have a life of crime. You just need to have the balls to charge $3 for a cup of coffee. Anyway, and then you have, of course, where's Shu? Is he here? Whoa, it's getting personal now. No, but then you have these guys hold up their checks. I made $100,000. Yay! I made $300,000. Hooray! I mean, come on. Really? You made $100,000. Great. You can buy, like, a closet in a Manhattan apartment. The truth is, publishing and building quality sites is a very slow and mundane process if you want to build something of quality. Here is five of the blogs we created, Engadget, Autoblog, Joystick, TV Squad, and Blogging Stocks. And this is the ranking on Alexa. It's not perfect, but it gives you the general trend line versus the rest of the internet. This isn't page use. This is the trend line versus other sites. But what you see is Engadget and Autoblog and Joystick, it takes two or three years to reach your natural audience. Sometime in the third year, you reach your natural audience. And then you have a great business that's predictable, like Autoblogs, where you get 10 million visitors a month. And then when they have their big auto show, they get 20, 25. That's the good part of business. So I'm presenting the good and the bad about gaming the system, right? That's what we're talking about. And again, I'm not saying everybody in this room is gaming the system. But we all know, because I'm not going to make that mistake again like I did with SEOs. Where I didn't know there were good SEOs. I never met you know, any of these SEOs in person. The only, my only impression of when I made that comment, SEO is bullshit, that was based upon 10 years of people emailing me or calling me saying, hey, uh, you want to have Engadget rank better? And I'll be like, what do you mean rank better? On SERPs. And I'm like, what? What's a SERP? On a search engine page. You know, we can guarantee you the number one slot. And I'm like, for what? For any keyword, any 10 keywords will get you the number one slot. I mean, can you, first of all, can you stop talking like you're on like the Z Morning Zoo? <laughs> Number two, oh, what do you mean? Like, well, uh, you know, and so then I'd say like, well, if you type in like POM 700W or whatever, like we're number one ahead of POM and we didn't even try. We don't do any SEO here. And that was the origin of the quote. The quote's gotten a little bit of a life of its own, but the origin of it was I was at SES like three or four years ago and somebody said, how does Engadget rank so well? And I said, I don't know, we produce good content every day. We have, you know, we're investing a million bucks a year in this thing. It's, you know, doing incredible. And, um, they said, yeah, but has it ranked so well? And I said, I, I don't know. We don't do anything. And they said, well, who's your SEO? And I said, I don't, I don't have an SEO. This SEO is bullshit. And they're like, what? The whole audience. And I said, what? Is anybody in the audience an SEO? And they all raise their hand. Like, imagine the whole audience raise their hand. I said, well, not you guys. I'm talking about the other ones. But it was true because my impression of SEOs was just these people calling me saying, give us $5,000 a month. You have to sign this 24-month contract. You can't cancel it. But anyway, it's a, you don't need to cancel it because I'm going to make that money back for you. And I was like, you know what? Whenever anybody wants a guaranteed contract for 24 months and they can't tell you exactly how they do what they do, you like, if you go to one of these SEOs when they speak at a conference, I mean, have you ever heard somebody speak in a circle? It's really important. You got to know your dig. You got to know you're delicious. You got to get your ranking right. And uh, you got to, it's very, and then somebody asked the audience, well, what do you do actually to get the ranking to go up? It's really complicated. I'll take that question offline with you. It'd be wonderful to talk to you afterwards. Okay, so then next slide. And then they just like, every question is, I'll talk to you afterwards. And they take out that contract. You want to sign it? Anyway, so the arguments against gaming. Um, a lot of people think this gaming is going to come to an end. And the reason they do is, well, human-powered search can't be gamed, and a lot of the human systems that are being created, you may believe that, you may not. The truth is probably somewhere in between. You know, it's, it can be gamed at high cost, which in the cost is much greater than what you'd ever make back. The semantic web is impossible to game. Some people are saying, well, PowerSet hasn't launched anything, and these semantic websites don't exist. So it's another one of these sort of Web 2.0 Silicon Valley bubble conversations like, Theoretically, semantic web camp. I don't even know what the semantic web is. I think it means that you have tags or something. Um, I think it's a way to intimidate normal people into thinking that they're too stupid to build websites, frankly. Um, and pretty convincing argument is there's an increasing number of high quality sites, uh, and it's going to be harder to compete with a you know, thin affiliate site or a low quality site, which I think a lot of people are starting to believe. I, I saw Michael Gray say it's ending. 
um, arguments for gaming. Well, you know, any system can be gamed. That's theoretically true. I mean, you could break a lot of cryptography and you could break into the Pentagon or, you know, like Mission Impossible, whoever they break into. You could break into, you know, any number of places. It just might be not economically viable to actually break in. You know, like a lot of what Lex Luthor did was a little bit too expensive to be practical. Um, uh, gamers are getting smarter and smarter. That is true. I mean, these people who are doing the gaming are pretty brilliant. Uh, and some people say a lot of these social networks and news sites are the ultimate covert marketing systems because it's based on personality and you can just have 50 of your friends doing stuff and they act really well and then every 51st link is spam and then every 151st link is spam or affiliate or whatever. And it leads me to a really funny thing. Somebody told me they could have spam one of our sites really easily. And I said, well, how would you do that? He said, well, I would create a really high quality site and I'd submit it. Then I would change the really high quality site to like a thin affiliate spam site and you would never know because you would have put the good one in. And I'd say, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, why wouldn't you just leave the good one up? You didn't have an answer for that. And I get you into that criminal psyche of like, it's more fun to game than it is to build something of quality. But let's talk about the brutal truth here. The truth is, you guys, I'm talking to affiliate sort of thin affiliate people. I don't know if anybody in here, I'm assuming nobody here is a thin affiliate. Okay, good. Um, you guys really think small. Holding up a six-figure check is frankly pathetic. It's desperate. The industry I'm in, like the internet industry, like web 2.0 industry, elitist, you know, Kevin Rose, whatever, like they would laugh at that. It's sad. It's embarrassing. Really? You, I mean, um, but the other truth is that SEO and affiliate people I've met are some of the smartest freaking people I've ever met. They're really brilliant. They work seven, eight hours a day. I'm sorry, seven, eight days a week, 12 hours a day. How many people here work seven, hour, seven days a week? I mean, if I did that at a Web 2.0 conference, they'd be like, what, seven days a week? I don't work seven days a week. I go to yoga, I go to rock climbing, I gotta go biking in Tiburon, you know, like in the valley you have to have balance, you know, like I'm from Brooklyn, like I work every day, you know, I don't wanna like, what, go biking, that's weak. Um, in fact, I love to hire the top 10 SEO affiliates, take them away from the life of crime and have them work on my company. They're that smart. So what should you do if you're one of these thin affiliate people or you're people who are sort of acting in that like less work for more money kind of zone? And I know that's not everybody in the audience. Did I give enough disclaimers? I'm trying to, I don't want to get my ass kicked again like I did last time. That's the only. Um, so this is my selfish version. I'm running a human powered search engine. I don't want to mention the name because I don't want to get accused of promoting too heavily and you all know it anyway. Notice I didn't say the name once. Um, my selfish view of the world is What's that? Oh, I can say it? Nobody's going to hackle me? Um, stay the course. Okay? Keep polluting the web with low quality sites. That benefits me. That makes my curated service even better. In fact, I think you should increase the amount and complexity of the gaming on social news sites you're doing. And finally, you should find new ways to covertly advertise to these unsuspecting users' paper post. I think you guys could take it to another level of deception. Really think like of the most unsophisticated technically person in your family, like maybe your aunt who's really nice, and then think of her going, dream of her going to a website, and then think of ways that you could take her money without her knowing it, and ways you can have her waste time and click on links that are actually deceptive. Really want you to think about how to get grandma's money and Auntie Belle's money and really abuse them. That's the Paper Post mission. I'm sorry, Ikea. We had to change our name because Paper Post is so poisoned and Google kicked us out. Desperate. And also, be more creative in your use of malware, adware, and click fraud. I mean, have we really taken this as far as we can go? I mean, there's got to be more we can do here. But that's my selfish view of the world. But I'm feeling charitable today, so I'm going to give you the unselfish version as well. The unselfish version says, hey, Let's be real. Realize you're the bottom of the food chain. Stop fighting with each other over this bullshit affiliate, like getting people to sign up and building these stupid sites with the yellow highlighted text and, you know, you know, oh, is that your site? 
you know, like I, you scroll down. I, I know it's like study, A, B, study, show it's like the best thing in the world, but it's gaming. I mean, you guys are like, and I'm talking to that section of people in the room who are a part of that. It's like you're infomercial people, you know? Create loving, long-term relationships with users based on high-quality content and services. That's what you need to do. Long-term success, not the quick hit. The quick hit is going away. Hallelujah. Give up a life of crime and holding up $100,000 checks. And try to get checks with two or three more zeros, because that's how we do in the valley. That's real business. Your $100,000, wouldn't they wouldn't let you into Silicon Valley with that. Are you kidding me? They spend more on segues. And realize that you guys are smarter than most of the people working at these big internet companies. I was at a big internet company that shall remain nameless. And those people work six hours a day. And if you count the three meetings they go to where nothing is accomplished, I'm not talking about that company, I'm talking in general, these companies. They work one hour a day. And they take six weeks vacation. They do nothing. They don't, they, you say to them, oh, stumble upon delicious, have you seen PMOG? They're like, yeah, I totally know, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. The only thing they've done is scan a TechCrunch headline. They, have, they aren't in there doing it. They don't understand it like you guys do. You guys are brilliant compared to them. You're brilliant compared to them. But they think big and you think small. That's the disparity. You guys don't think that you can do what they do. You're intimidated. You shouldn't be. The bottom line, someone in this very room could create StumbleUpon, Flickr, Gawker, or Weblogs, Inc. Instead, you're creating bullshit affiliate sites to make $10,000, to make $100,000. Congratulations. StumbleUpon sold for $75 million. What's wrong with you people? Think about it. $300,000 check. You don't see the StumbleUpon guy holding up a $75,000 check, do you? $75 million check? You don't want anybody to know he made that much money. He's like, oh, no, I just do what I love. I just love the internet, I just do what I love. Like in the Valley, they don't even talk about money. That's like, you talk about, you hold up a check, they would like, like oh, no, 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 no. Don't do that, you know? Someone in this room could create the next Yahoo, Google, PayPal, Facebook, MySpace, and eBay. I believe that. I, oh, you did? Oh, you're going to. <laughs> but the problem is you probably won't. Because these type of people are wired for the quick buck. And you may be afraid of the potential disappointment that comes from trying to do something really great like that and failing. That's the truth about the fear of failure. Most people take the downside risk and they overestimate it. And they take the upside risk and they underestimate it. That's just evolution. Because 100 times if you go over the hill and 99 times nothing happens, but the 100th time a saber-toothed tiger rips your throat out, we're going to over time say, you know what, I'm not going to go over that hill. I'm not going to try to climb that hill because I may get destroyed by a tiger. And then what happens is tigers become extinct, but people still don't want to climb over the hills. There's no downside. If you fail, who cares? This is America. You fail, you close the company, you start the next one the next day. There's unlimited amount of investment capital out there. There's unlimited amount of opportunity. And failure is part of it. I mean, if you fail and your car goes off this dock, and then you try to pick it up and take it out of the water and then the crane falls in and you fail again and just get a bigger crane and if that crane falls in then you should just realize that the three thousand dollar automobile wasn't worth as much as two cranes but anyway you have to try that's what I'm telling you people you have to try I mean video on the web failed now this is a little like interactive part of the demo I'm gonna say video on the web failed and you tell me your favorite video site on the web that failed in the web 1.0 was? What'd you say? No. What's another big video site that failed high profile web 1.0? Broadcast.com, uh, $5 billion, kind of hard to describe as a failure, but I said pseudo. Until the video site that succeeded was? OK, you guys are getting it. Social networks on the web failed. Which one failed the first one? No, it was six degrees until the first successful one was? MySpace. All right, we're getting this. Music on the web failed. The music site that failed in Web 1.0 was? Napster, correct. Until who made music on the web work? 
Apple, right. This is what I'm talking about. You guys are fucking smart. These are the smart people in the internet industry. They know the whole history. They've been around since 95. Brilliant. Making $100,000. Search engines were lame. You can pick which one you want here because we can just go through all, this could take all day. Until, thank you. And of course, human powered search failed. Until next time. That's it. I think we have time for one question slash plug. Just kidding. We have time for tons of questions. You can ask me anything. Call bullshit. I'm sure some people are going to tell me, is it Mahalo and SEO? Jason, Dave Belka, how are you? I think you need to go closer to, to the microphone. Yeah, go. We'll do that. We'll do that so you hear me. Yeah. Um, really nice talk. Really dead on. What I didn't hear you talk about is your role in this. Oh, my role. Your role in it. Yes. When you were at Sequoia and you were an entrepreneur in residence, you sent out your whole entire address book to LinkedIn. Yep. And then you never responded to any of that. Then you responded to you know Twitter. You've sent me dozens of Facebook invites, which I've never accepted. <laughs> At that SEO is bullshit speech, I was there with you, so, and we talked, we talked afterwards, and then you said Dig was brilliant, yet people are pushing through content that's stolen from other blogs through Dig's wrapped in AdSense and yep. crappy CPM ads and all Absolutely. that kind of stuff. And you guys have the Alexa toolbar installed on all the machines at Mahalo. Yeah, we do. And that game's that. So, so what's right, your responsibility so me, in this, Jason? Yes, And, and are you a hypocrite? Okay, I, we knew the hypocrite question was coming, so let me start backwards. Yes, I use Facebook, LinkedIn. Yes, it does invite people to those services, and some people consider those invite spam. Uh, yes, I do get swarmed with a lot of people, and I don't respond to every single person who contacts me every day. But I don't think that that's spamming. Um, you know, using Facebook and LinkedIn. Has anybody ever used, like, an, you know, check your address book on Facebook or LinkedIn or something? Nobody in this room's ever used it? Of course, everybody's used it. Um, and Alexa, we actually have a good reason for using it, which is that we like to check the Alexa ranks of sites before we put them into Mahalo. But in terms of my contribution, uh, I started Weblogs Inc., which has the number one blog in every vertical it competes in, cars, autos, joystick, video games, and I paid 400 bloggers a month, really good salary, and gave them a huge opportunity, and uh, treated them really well, never edited their voices, and allowed them to continue on blogging with their voice without having it impacted by the advertising. They found out about the advertising when it came out, so I'm very proud of the work we did there. And those sites continue to be a best of breed and high quality. And I did Propeller, and when I did Propeller Netscape, I put a layer of editorial on top of it. So I took the Dig Delicious model, and I said, let's put editorial curation on top of it. And I paid 30 people to watch the incoming stuff and take out the spam and remove the stuff that you're complaining about on Dig. So I think I did actually evolve the social news space. Um, and now you see Kevin Rose saying they're doing moderation on Dig now because the problem has gotten so bad. So actually, I did say Dig was brilliant. I do agree with you that Dig is filled with a lot of spam now. And Kevin Rose agrees, and he's doing what I did at Netscape. So I don't think it's hypocritical. I think actually maybe I was a little ahead of the curve on that one. I don't want to give myself too, cre too much credit because I think it's kind of obvious that somebody should be looking at the homepage and taking out the spam. Um, and finally, the site I'm working on now, Mahalo, I mean, the premise of it is um, to create spam-free search results. So I think I've actually made a career out of building high-quality sites. Um, I don't know, did I defend myself OK without sounding like I was defending myself? Anyway, thank you. No, I mean, listen, you, you don't think I, people on in Gadget were and Joystick were like, hey, can I spare a dig? You don't see me say, can you spare a dig? Of course. I mean, we're all you know, trying to feature the content we have. And a lot of what I talk about in these talks is, you know, I have the same internal conflict sometimes. Should we spend more time promoting our how-to articles or more time making them better? And you know, every now and again, you get to this point where you're like, you're spending more time doing promotion of content than you are making it. And so it's a dangerous place to be. And so it's really hard to balance for publishers. And that was one of the reasons I created Mahalo was because we talked to, every, has anybody submitted a link to a page on Mahalo? Oh, wow, no more people. Has anybody got one on a page? Right. And how was that process? Was it good? Like, 
did the, has anybody ever been who has submitted been contacted by the guide who edited it? Yeah, you all have because that's what we do. So I have, you know, furthering this discussion, we have six, seven hundred links submitted a day. We look at every single one. And we, either, and we tell the person if we're not going to accept it, why? And how to make their site better. So, I don't know. I, I think I'm sort of, I kind of think of that. It's my strength, the curation part. Next hey, Jason. Question. So, the question is, is you're, you know, you're in Santa Monica, you know, hundred thousand, you know, million dollar condos and all that fun stuff. The question is, is how do you scale? You know, hiring an employee at seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year to look at links all day long, you know, doesn't. Great question. Well. I got that's the number one question I get from venture capitalists. Are you a venture capitalist? Uh, no. Okay. Um, the number one question I get from uh, venture capitalists is, how do you scale a service like Mahalo? Um, and I point them back to Weblogs Inc. and say, well, at Weblogs Inc., at the peak, we were doing 10, 12,000 blog posts per month. And that seemed like an impossible task at the start of the company. Um, and we were paying them 10 to $15 per blog post. And that seemed like an impossible amount of money to pay for it. But what we found was there were a large number of people who, if they could get paid for writing something, they didn't need to make a lot of money. If they made 10 or 15 bucks an hour or 20 bucks an hour, that was enough working from home part-time. There were a lot of people looking for that work. In fact, it's sort of this middle market that isn't addressed in our society. You know, uh, stay-at-home uh, mom or dad. Uh, a lot of cases it was dads. And, uh, you know, want to work for four hours a day doing something, you know, engaging. And so uh, about a month into Mahalo, we launched something called The Greenhouse. And if you go to greenhouse.mahalo.com, you'll see we pay people anywhere from 3 or $4 all the way up to $20 to write search results for us. So actually, uh, we have 50 people in Santa Monica, and yes, they're expensive, and yes, it's not cheap, the real estate. Um, but uh, 80, 90 percent of the creation of the content we're doing now is done by people in the greenhouse. We just check it, and we just train them. So we outsource it uh, to people. Or I call it insourcing because we sort of go to middle America as our sweet spot, you know. Um, and that's how it scales. And if you compare it, so it's a large-scale distributed workforce is what I call it. Um, and there's a lot more people online now who are really talented in content. You know, we hire people who work on Dig or who worked on the DMAs, who are not SEOs, uh, people who work on Wikipedia. So there's, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people out there who work on Wikipedia every week probably. And uh, we hire a bunch of them. We target them. They're working on Wikipedia for free. Why not work on our stuff and get paid? So it works. Good question. Hi, Jason. Um, I can already picture the blog post now of how you think every affiliate link is a spam. And I want to give you the chance to tell us what kind of affiliate link and content you don't believe is spam before you get trashed by our community as well. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not a fan of deceptive marketing. I like ads to be labeled ads. And I know that, uh, and I don't know a lot about your industry. I know it makes a lot of money, and I know there's a lot of people here. Um, but I'm pretty sure that you're not required to disclose that the affiliate link is an ad. Like, you don't have to do that, right? That's just correct, right? Correct. Um, and that kind of advertising I've never been fond of. I like people to know if it's an ad or not. Um, and then people say, well, why do they need to know? And if Boing Boing makes money off of their Amazon book stuff, it doesn't seem like such a big deal. But I'm an old school editor, and my fear is that if you make money off of what you link to in an article, then publishers are going to write more articles about things that pay better. And if you follow that ratings game, then every story on the cover of the New York Times website would be about online dating or the Kindle. I don't know what pays the most in affiliates. But you basically would be reading the cover of the New York Times with all these hidden affiliate links in it. So I think the, the fact that affiliate links are not disclosed is a big problem for me. And the fact that a lot of the spam on the web, what, uh, what people call index spam uh, in search engines, is driven by affiliate links. Some of it's for AdSense and Yahoo Publisher Network, but a lot of it's for affiliates. And it seems like the, a lot of the people who build those sites are, less cons are, are operating out of a space where can we minimize the amount we're spending and maximize the amount we make in the shortest period of time. And I think that's kind of accurate for a portion of the affiliate world. And then there's a portion of people who are making high quality sites over the long term, and those people I applaud. So like anything else, there's black, white, and there's a large part of gray, like SEO. I've learned Bruce Clay, great guy, doing high quality stuff, helping people make better sites more than he's doing black hat SEO, certainly not doing black hat. And there's like the gray in the middle. So 
Um, I think there is affiliate spam, and I think there's good affiliate links. But I could be wrong. I mean, I'm not an expert on this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Hey, Jason. Uh, I'm the guy that wrote the story about his grandmother using Mahalo last week. Thank and, you for uh, that. Well, no, my question that is... That was my favorite story about Mahalo to date. I mean, my question is, is that what you're targeting? Is you're targeting? I mean, because it seems like, you know, yes. I mean, it's not yes. highly useful for me, but my it's grandmother not. uses it every day. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we'll get to you, but <laughs> the truth <laughs> is, if you're a power surfer, you can open up your, you know, you, you know what websites to go directly to, right? If you've been on the internet for 10 years and you spent eight hours a day on the web or 12 hours a day on the web, you know if you're looking for hotels, go to Photos Fromers, New York Times, Lonely Planet, Yelp for restaurants in America, Zagat for restaurants, you know, in second tier cities in America, and Michelin for a city, you know, for restaurants and hotels in Europe. Like you probably have that knowledge base. Everybody here probably has that. But your grandma, or your mom, or your uncle, or your brother who's not on the internet all that number of hours, they may not know about Lonely Planet or Photos or Fromers or even how to navigate their site that they have a Paris section and they have Paris tours. So when you look at our Paris Hotels page or Paris Tours page, we go curate all that information because if you do a search for Paris Hotels on Google or Yahoo, TripAdvisor is the only one that comes up. Photos, Fromers, Lonely Planet, none of these, these, these sites rank anymore. Why don't they rank? They don't rank because the affiliate, then affiliate sites have pushed them all down. The then affiliate sites do not deserve those positions. And that's the reason why I created Mahalo because I saw that opportunity. Uh, and, I, and it's working and we do have that same exact experience that your grandmother had, which is if you're a normal person, 90% of America, 95%, you just want to get good information and get off the internet. You know, you want to get to it quick, you want to do your business and get back to your life. And it's not like us where we're just like, oh, I'm going to open up seven different search engines, delicious, I'm going to do a tags and then I'm going to sort by popular and then I'm going to sort by date and then I'm going to add a second tag and then I'm going to go to stumble upon, I'm going to hit the drop down for travel, I'm going to hit random, then I'm going to look at this person's profile page because they put something good, they must have something better. Like that stuff is what we do. That stuff is five, ten years away from, I mean, people don't even know how to use the address bar. I mean, people are typing yahoo.com into google.com. I mean, we greatly overestimate the knowledge base of our users. Um, and it's just because they don't spend 12, I mean, think about it. We spend 12, 18 hours a day on the internet, seven days a week. They spend 12 hours a month or a week, a tenth of what we spend. So yes, that is the market. But I do think that actually we will have things for, uh, people who are in the top 5% because you may just say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to Munich, I don't have time to do my own research, and if you look at our Las Vegas hotels page or Munich hotels page, maybe it saves you time and you can get the phone number of the front desk without having to go through all these affiliate sites that won't put the phone number of the front desk because they're scared to death that you're actually going to call the hotel and get a better deal. We're not afraid, all I care about is making the user experience better. <laughs> and that's why if you're a thin affiliate site, you should be scared to death of people like me and other people who have lots of resources who are going to create much better quality sites and we know how to do SEO, and, you know, and we know how to social media optimize, and we're gonna take your rank. And it's not just me, there's gonna be 20 people doing this. These second click services, as some people are calling it, I think it's kind of a cool name. You know, pulling the second click up to the first click, Wikipedia was the first site, we're one of them, Noel is one of them. Associated content, I guess, is sort of, but their content is a little bit shaky at times. But they sort of have the right idea. Um, so it's gonna be interesting, I think. I think you know, Michael Gray, who's a really brilliant guy, I mean, the, the best thing that came out of the SEO bullshit comment was that it created a really good dialogue, I think, and it was a lot of angst about that issue that maybe hadn't been put out on the table, and I think there's a lot of angst in the affiliate space as well with this, you know, are we, are we being good to the users? How many people think that the affiliate industry is being good to users? Raise your hand. Mm. How many people think that the affiliate industry is that is at times being bad to users and abusing them. That's almost everybody and those were very reluctant hands coming up. So this is your industry. You have to police it, it's up to you. And you know what? You guys may, you have this beautiful lake, you're all fishing from it, but you may pollute it, there may be no more fish left soon. You guys could screw it up and you guys have to protect the lake. Everybody take a certain amount of fish out, throw back the fish that are smaller, do not put you know, you're, don't dump the oil from your engine into the river, because I know it's more convenient to just dump the oil overboard than actually have to carry it 50 feet to the drop-off point on the, on the dock. But if we all carry it to the 50-foot dock, then maybe there'll be bigger fish in the lake. Be better to the users. You, you, and it's actually, you know what? I could care less what you do. The more you screw it up, like I said in my selfish thing, the more value it adds to my service. So by all means, if you think I'm a jerk off and 
you know, I'm coming here being an idiot and being too aggressive with you guys, then please, by all means, pollute the web. It only makes my life better. It differentiates my service. It gives my service a reason to extra. Nothing would please me more than if SEOs and affiliates actually made Google and Yahoo search results worse. Make them worse. Better for me. Anyway. Hey, Jason. Jay Berkowitz. Ten rules. Ten golden rules. Ten golden rules. Dot com. Thank you. I read You've that done side. a great job building your personal brand. And I think your personal brand gave Mahalo a great kickstart out of the gate. What's some, what are some of the tips you can give us for building our personal brand and, and our products? You're going to find this amazing. I've never had a PR person in my life. I've gotten an absurd amount of press. And I can only attribute that to two things. One, I think I've worked on some interesting projects that have, you know, that on their own are worthy of some consideration. Uh, and then number two, I've been brutally honest. And I sort of come from the Mark Cuban school of personal branding. We've been friends since 96, 97. He was an investor in Mahalo, is an investor in Mahalo, was an investor in Weblogs Inc. And we've been friends for a while. Not BFF or anything like that, we're just friends. Um, and uh, it's so funny, it's like when you know Mark, when people know you know Mark Cuban, then everybody's like, hey, can you introduce me to Mark? You know, can, you, uh, can I get his phone number? And I don't know Mark Cuban's phone number. I've never talked to him on the phone. I've only traded emails with him. Uh, but, um, you know, the, if you're honest and real, you know, you run the risk of being misunderstood, right? And a lot of times people misunderstand what I say, and I sort of put myself out there as a target. But at the end of the day, I don't, even, I don't have to tell you what company I work for. I can come to this speaking gig and never mention Mahalo. How many people have been to Mahalo.com? Exactly, I think almost everybody. And uh, probably some people are pissed off at me and they're gonna pretend that they didn't go, but they went. I know you went, that guy went. I can tell. Um, but if not, he'll go later. And the fact is, you don't have to over-promote if, you if you're creating these discussions. So I think, number one, be honest and be yourself. It's corny, but it's true. It's sort of like the rules of dating. Um, I think you have to engage other people, you know, and, and create a dialogue. So um, has anybody here ever had me respond to them on Twitter, in email, Facebook, or on their blog? How many people have, like, traded emails? I mean, it's, I make myself ultimately accessible, and I have, like, ego feeds of everything. And so if you want to get in contact with me, if you write a blog post, uh, Jason Calacanis, I want to talk to you, it's going to come up on my ego feed, on my Google alert, whatever, in two different ways, and I'm going to come and check it out. Smart people do that. So if you are in the space of, let's say, affiliate marketing, and you pick the five people in this room who are the most influential, and you write, and you read their blogs, and their Twitter feeds, and you respond to them, all of a sudden they know you, and you have this relationship instantly. And um, I think it's credibly inserting yourself into the conversation. And if you think about it like a dinner party, if you got invited to a dinner party, um, you wouldn't just come in and be like, hey, Jason Calcanis, hey, I run the side, oh, what's going on? Oh, you know, like, hey, uh, can I sell you some insurance? Like, people are like, what the fuck did you invite this guy to the dinner party? Get invited to a dinner party, it's not your house, it's other people there, you don't know them. You sit and you listen, and you wait for a moment in time where you can insert something into the conversation that has value to other people. And I think that's what people miss in blogging and social, is that they come in like gangbusters. It's much more subtle than that. Like, Read something Robert Scoble is writing about. I mean, that's, a, that's a genius of Robert Scoble, right? He's better at this than I am. And he doesn't write about himself ever. He's like, wow, Quick is the most amazing service. Oh, I drove in the Tesla. It's incredible. All he does is talk about how great everybody else in the world is. And he's got the number one blog as an individual, you know, not professional blog. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, so I think talking about other people and what they're doing, that's interesting. I try to do that myself more and more often. It's hard, you know. I mean, I have so much stuff I want to promote about myself. To actually think about other people, it's hard. How does uh, Mahalo make money? Oof, when we start making money, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> no, it's a search engine, or a search service, or a directory, or it's DMOS 2.0, whatever you want to categorize it as. And it's the most established revenue stream in the existence of uh, advertising. You guys know search advertising is the most sought after click in the world. You guys know why. Because you have people's intent. They're making a gesture. And if I'm typing in Volvo C70 into Google or Yahoo or Mahalo and 
I'm there for a reason. And it's much better inventory than being on, say, even Autoblog. You know, if you're on Autoblog, we know you like cars, but we don't know what car, and we don't know when you want to buy a car. And if you're typing Volvo dealership Santa Monica, man, that's, a, that's just an awesome moment in any marketing marketers. Like that's the marketer's peak moment in existence is when they can get you while you're cognitively thinking about their product and considering it. So uh, if we get traffic and we have users and they love our service, there'll be absolutely no problem monetizing it. I mean, you can just do the math. If you look at Google makes 20 cents a click or something like that or whatever the average is, you know, and if you get a 0.1%, if you get a half percent click through or a 1% click through, you can just start doing the math. You make it $2 to $10 CPM or RPM, whatever, however you want to count it. Um, you know, you only have to get 10,000 pages to one of our, if we get 10,000 views on a page, it's at break even, right? If we spend 10, 15, 20 bucks making it. So, and then we might make a couple thousand dollars on some pages. So, um, it's a pretty good model if you can stick at it for five years. I don't think the model works if you do it for two or three or four. I think you have to do it for five or 10 years and become like Wikipedia or about and become an authority. So, I think you have to really have long-term thinking. That's why my advice is always when people say, like, hey, what's, you know, I want to build a network of blogs. I say, you know what? Build one blog that is profitable and that gets a loyal readership and then add the second. Uh, and some people just take the shotgun approach because starting is easy and finishing is hard. I feel like this has been good for all of us. I feel like it's like a certain, it was a little bit of anxiety about, it was a little tension about this talk. I feel like we, we did okay. Didn't we do okay? I think it did okay. We're feeling pretty good about it. Okay. Excuse me. No. Oh, hey. Okay. So I guess we got another question up here next, if we could. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. I guess you're saying that, you know, we should obviously, affiliates and things like that, they should try to create better content and, you know, really get... Or any content. Any content, exactly. But at the same time, you're also <laughs> saying, chase, you know, don't chase the $100,000, but chase, like, you know, the web 2.0 dream. And you're saying there's like unlimited capital available, which is just definitely not true for especially web companies. But, but my question is more about, um, how do you see like affiliates in like Asia and all these people that are coming online now? And, you know, obviously they're gonna be creating more crap. Right? But at the same time, you can see like places like Israel, which are getting better at creating companies and they have that kind of in investment environment. So, I mean, how do you really see this affecting the net? Like, do you see more crap coming online? Or, I mean, obviously you can tell us, and you know, we have huge influence on what happens near term, but what about these people around the world? I think there's gonna be a stratification of, on the internet between the open web and the curated web. There's gonna be two layers. And the, it's a great question, by the way. And um, I think that, yeah, you're gonna see more and more garbage. And as more and more garbage comes on the web, people are gonna go to protected, trusted sources more and more. And it's going to be hard. My first two investors, I can introduce you to them. American Express and Visa. Those were the two investors in Silicon Alley Reporters. So I think that you're maybe being a little bit of a crybaby about it. There's plenty of money available out there. Build some, I'm not putting the spot, but I mean, I always hear this like, oh, there's no capital and you need permission from somebody to do something. There's tons of capital out there. You just put some money on your credit card, make a good site and, you know, uh, be patient, and that's the thing that's missing is patience. You know, the way I was able to start Silicon Alley Reporter was I was an IT consultant. So I did IT, fixing people's computers. Like literally, I used to fix laser, fix laser printers. That was my first gig. I fixed the HP LaserJet 1, and all my shirts had toner up and down. I busted my ass, and at night wrote a freaking magazine that was a 16-page photocopy. And it slowly built up, so you have to be patient. Um, and I can't really hear him, but. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, listen, there's, I think I get what you're getting at, which is it's hard to rank. It's hard, you know, yeah, of course, business is hard. Making money is hard. Being successful is hard. Yes, I agree. It's hard to do good work. But if you do, if you work hard and it doesn't work out and you get a low reward, at least you've worked hard. And you had a chance at maybe going for the, you know, what you call the Web 2.0 dream. I'm not saying you have to buy into like the, the bad part of like Silicon Valley hype, but you should try to 
build something of substance that's real, that people love, and that you can be proud of. That's a better path. That's a much better path, because even if you don't do it, at least you'll have tried to do something big and of substance. Look at it this way. You, you, and this is why in my career, as I've been able to get access to more resources and do bigger projects, I basically said to myself, what's the biggest opportunity I could go after? Because I work 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, just like you guys, seven days a week. I obsess about what I do. I love it. But going after a $1 million opportunity, $10 million opportunity, $100 million opportunity, or a $1 billion opportunity, you're going to put the same number of hours in. So why not shoot for you know, the stars and get the moon, as opposed to shooting for, you know, I'm going to get an affiliate site that's going to make me a quick 100K. I don't know. It's, it, it's just, you get older, you start to realize there's nothing different about those people. That's what I've learned. Because, I, I, listen, I was an outcast in the tech industry. I don't know if anybody knows me from the Silicon Alley Reporter days. Who here's from early? I mean, I was the outcast of outcasts. People didn't want to let me. I had to fight my way into the industry. So I know what it's like to be an outsider. I, I, nobody would do business with me or let, publish me. So you know what I had to do? I had to start my own magazine. And trust me, people did not like the fact that I started my own magazine. They hated me in New York for a while. True or not true? There's a lot of jealousy in there. Like, he started his own magazine, then he, oh, then he made it, and then I just did the coup d'etat. I was like, oh, you know what? You guys don't want me to be involved? You don't want to invite me to parties? I'm making a list of the top 100 people in Silicon Alley. <laughs> That's what I did. I said, okay, I'm going to make the list. And then everybody got in line. Then everybody invited me to a party. Then everybody wanted to have lunch with me. So you just got to be gangster about it. If they're not going to let you go do it, you can just do it. Take what's yours. Respect. <laughs> Booyakasha. Very good. Speaking of that, um, my question is kind of similar to where I'm going with what I'm trying to do. After you sell Mahalo, uh, how much do you expect to pay for the New York Knicks? It's a great question. It's a great question. And I never like to start negotiating before the actual negotiation occurs. So, no. Um, I would like to buy the Knicks. It's a complete, utter disaster. Um, I actually don't intend on selling Mahalo. I know that sounds like a crazy thing. I have this vision that if I work really hard at it for the next five years, it might, it, there's a chance it could become one of those seminal internet brands like an eBay or a Yahoo. And that's my dream. And so I get a chance to go after my dream. And if I fail, I tried. I tried. That's worth something in this world, isn't it? No doubt. So. But I, I will, if, if I get there, I'm buying those Knicks. I already told my wife, I was like, if we make a lot of money and it's like we have one million more dollars than buying the Knicks, I'm still going to buy the Knicks. And then we'll just have like a million dollars in the bank and we're going to have to live in like a studio apartment. <laughs> It'd be pretty funny if in 10 years I bought the Knicks. Wouldn't that be funny? And they could go back to this tape and you ask me that question and then we have it on tape. It'd be like on Sports Center or something like that. Cool. A lot of affiliate marketers will never receive a $100,000 check, and there's a lot of small affiliates out there that would dream of making 100000 a year. Why do you feel so negatively about them posting their pictures of their checks on the internet? Yeah. Um, number one, I think that they're doing it because they're trying to rope people into clicking on the get-rich-click money schemes. So they're trying to actually get people excited who are poor people who need to make money and they're trying to get them excited about a get rich quick scheme just like the real estate industry and when you go to their site all the ads are for joining other affiliate programs where they make 50 bucks when they join them so I don't like Ponzi schemes and I also think it's kind of desperate to be like holding up the check it's just sad and if I just wanted to put those up there so you guys understand how your industry is looked at is looked at as like I don't know, I don't want to be like cruel or something like that, but it's not looked at in high regard. But you guys know that, right? I mean, I, do I think they're trying to inspire them? You know, it's, I think it's, what's inspiring is creating great content, you know, and making a great service that people love. I, you know, Twitter is inspiring to me, Pounce is inspiring to me, you know, certain blogs are inspiring to me, Tech Meme is inspiring to me. When I see somebody produce some content, you know, it's like, it's gratuitous to hold up your check, also. It's uncouth in many ways. And again, I talked about our AdSense revenue, so I'm probably a hypocrite. We were part of the AdSense case study, so they talked about our revenue, too, so I'm probably a hypocrite. I just think that 
Also, the thing that about it is like if this is the best you can do, like you have to realize these guys are, and I, I think they're nice guys, and I think they're smart. They're actually pretty freaking smart. Like those guys are smarter than most of the CEOs I meet. That's the, see, that's the thing that when I was writing this keynote and I was trying to figure out what to try to communicate, I realized you know, there's a huge disparity between your knowledge base and how you get paid. And in the Valley, it's the opposite. They don't have the same knowledge base as you guys, but they're making bank. And what's the difference? The difference is in what you guys are putting on the plate. Those, those folks are thinking about making great products. You guys are thinking about making great profits. So you're taking the short-term profit route, but not the long-term product route. And if you guys just focused on, instead of the quick profit, the great site, trying to build the number one service that was better than Twitter, that was better than Pounce, that was better than Engadget, Weblogs Inc., whatever, a, you know, a better product, you would add a zero or two or three to those checks. I guarantee you of that. All you have to do is get 10 million, 20 million people coming, only 10 or 20 million people, coming to your site every month. Well, it seems impossible, but here's a test for you. Start out with 10,000 people coming to your site every month, and then plot out 10% growth, 20% growth, and 30% growth. And if you do that, if you get that 30% curve, you look like YouTube or Facebook or MySpace. If you get the 20% curve, you look like Weblogs Inc. or Pounce or Twitter. And if you get the 10% curve, you look like StumbleUpon or maybe some smaller size. Even if you just get that 10% compounded growth every month and you take a 36-month view of the world or a 48-month view of the world or, God forbid, a 60-month view of the world, you'll have a huge business. And instead of making, you know, trying to make this quick box, you'll make that really substantial money and you'll have pride in what you've built. I just think it's a better route, and it's, a, it's almost like a waste to see so many smart people like chasing their tails. It's like SEOs, they're chasing their tails. They, they work for six months, they get caught in some big stream of traffic, and then they chase for the next one. And they, it's a crack, you know? It's like, yeah, you can sprint really fast if you're taking crack, but you're not gonna run the marathon. Run the marathon, you'll feel better afterwards with no drugs. Another question. I could do this all day. Hi, I'm Steve Navazio. Um, in line with what you've been saying, part of the problem with the internet, opposed to other mass media, is the reach, or lack thereof. For national companies to have the reach on the internet, how do you see that being addressed, other than waiting for Mahalo to overtake Google, to be able to get the reach so that we can work at a higher level? Yeah, um, number one, we're really not in competition with Google. They're our partner. Uh, we use their ads, and uh, we're ranked in their search results because we're a content company, which is kind of hard for people to get their head around when I say it's a content company, but we are. We're using humans. Um, so we're partners with them, and you don't, we don't need to beat them to and have a Google killer, like everybody wants us to be a Google killer. It's kind of crazy, but um, sort of consider them like Microsoft and they're the operating system, and we're an application that plugs into that operating system. Um, but... Um, so, yes, there are people, I think what your question sort of gets to is, you know, like, if everybody's cheating, how can you succeed without cheating? You know, like, if everybody's SEOing, everybody's spamming, everybody's indexing, how can you succeed without doing it? Um, it's sort of like in baseball, I guess everybody was taking steroids at a certain point in time, and um, I think you can succeed both ways. You could succeed at a life of crime, and you can succeed doing the right thing. Both things can be successful. You can't succeed doing the right thing. Okay, well, I mean, that was what I was talking about with the criminal mentality when we started the discussion is that some people actually believe that good people can't do good work and have a successful outcome. You can. It can be done. Oh. Oh, okay, so, yeah. Okay, so advertisers like to buy at scale, right? Um, that's true. So to reach, we didn't have national advertisers in year one of Weblogs Inc. We had networks or whatever we used and plugged in. And um, what we did was we looked for people, national advert, when we got some traffic, we looked for people and we said, hey, would you like to be in a partnership with us? Would you like to buy it for the whole year? And we created sponsorship packages. And if you have a really great product that people love, they will buy those things. I mean, Apple would advertise on Engadget when it only had 50,000 people a day. And it was because they loved the site. So actually, what I like to do is make such a great product 
that the advertisers just fall in love with it themselves personally. That was always my trick. And so when we develop relationships with the advertisers as a CEO publisher, I would email them and say, hey, you know, Jane Doe or, you know, over at Dell or John Smith over at Texas Instruments, you should check out this feature we just did. It's really great, uh, this feature story. And I would talk to them about the product. I never talked about advertising. I never brought it up. I just talked about the product and how exciting it was. And then at some point they'd say, oh, we're doing an ad buy. Can we put some stuff on there? I said, okay. But no hard sell. Just make a great product and let them know that you have a great product and never bring up sales. Then they come to you. Sort of like you know, when you're an interesting person, you've got a lot going on all of a sudden. Like you know in your life when things were really good and you have a lot going on and then all of a sudden like guys or girls just start talking to you and it's like everybody wants to date you and then when you're like sort of down and out and you're kind of depressed, nobody wants to date you. It's like that. Like if you have some like really cool product, like everybody's like, yeah, it's really good. I want to hang out with you. Did you, are you live streaming or just recording? Oh, that was live. So thank you, Jason. Jason Kalkanis. So I'll be here. Jason's going to be here for the next two days. Uh, I'll be here until t uh, yeah, sort of the end of the day tomorrow. So I'm around. Anybody want to play Texas Hold'em poker? So let's rehash. Yeah, you, let's go. you hate all of us. I love. I get. No, I get okay. a hug. <laughs> no, thanks, Jason. Uh, we My appreciate pleasure. it. And uh, quick note: remember, lunch is at 12:30 for everybody except exhibitors who go at noon. And there's a uh, networking session tonight at 5. Other than that, there's a Webmaster Radio Party tonight with Pepper Jam, Forge, and Rocket Profit. And what? And is the, the awards are tonight at the networking session, right? See, I'm doing a... Yeah, so enjoy the day. Have a great day, and we'll see you around. <laughs>